and welcome to Macro Business Radio Podcast. Today I'm talking with Leith Van Onselen. Leith, of course, is the Chief Economist and Co-Founder of Macro Business. It's always a pleasure to chat. Leith, thank you for joining us. Let's start off with the main course. And at the moment, we're in a country where we have an election due in a, within the next 10 months. We have a population which is amongst the most indebted privately in the world, where we have amongst the world's most extortionate housing costs, as well as energy costs and internet costs. At the moment, it appears to me that, as you've often pointed out, we have the wheels spinning as an economy, but the car isn't moving. We've got consumer spending, consumer credit, and per capita incomes are either worsening or in outright contraction. We have a national discourse where even the mainstream media has picked up some of the issues about housing and energy costs. We've got jobs growth that appears very, very reliant on government spending and particularly the bedpan economy spending centred on around the NDIS. And we've got government spending to a large extent and a larger extent than any time in the past, dependent on taxing people. And when it's not taxing people, it's dependent on coal, gas and iron ore, which prices are reasonably firm for, but the world is trying to get out of coal. Gas Australia has completely massacred so that it now has amongst the world's most expensive energy and iron ore, China is also trying to wean itself off fixed capital spending, and we're awaiting the onset of a low-cost iron ore production venture come online. You've been calling the shots on the Australian economy at Macro Business for about just over 12 years, by my reckoning. Has it ever been more precarious than it is now? Well, it all depends on how you look at it, you know. Uh, we, we just this week received the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report, which showed that Australians are the second richest households on earth. So, you know, according to that, everything's hunky-dory, but I'm just being a little bit facetious there. So the way that wealth report is measured is basically because we have some of the most expensive housing in the world and Australians, Australia's wealth is concentrated in housing, Australia's there, Australians therefore are rich which is absolutely crazy. But everything everything you've just said is a beautiful synopsis of, what, of, of the position that the Australian economy is in right now. We've just had a record decline in real per capita household disposable income, one of the biggest declines in the world. We've also had, as the OECD pointed out this week in its latest employment report, Australia's real wages have lost about 14 years of gains. They're now down to 2010 levels. And they've fallen almost by the most in the world since the pandemic. So for all intents and purposes, Australian living standards are going backwards. However, the economy has once again managed to you know, remain recession free in aggregate because we've just had yet again embarked on a mass immigration program, which has grown the population by about two and a half percent. We've added just under one million migrants, net overseas migrants in two calendar years. And because of that, Australia has once again skirted a recession, even though per capita GDP has declined for five consecutive quarters. And based on the, the available data, it's going to continue declining pretty much for the rest of this year. So, yes, Australia has, has painted itself into a corner. Uh, we have some of the world's most expensive energy prices, despite being what should be an energy superpower. We're swimming in coal, we're swimming in gas, we're swimming in all sorts of things other than oil. And we've also engineered, obviously, some of the most expensive housing in the world, a rental crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So the list just goes on. And, you know, at the same time as we've done all this, our manufacturing sector that was already amongst the smallest in the OECD continues to contract because of these high energy costs. And Australians face a situation whereby in the future, the only manufacturers that are going to remain 
are those that are relying on the government on, on the taxpayer teeth through the Albanese government's future made. So yes, we've pretty much stuffed up everything. We've stuffed up energy. We've stuffed up the housing market by running an absolutely gigantic immigration program. And because of those two things, we've we've got stubbornly high inflation uh, because of, you know, primarily because of these high energy costs and high population growth, which is pushing forcing up rents. Lee, and because of that, interest rates are going to stay high for longer. Before you started off, I was um, I was thinking of calling this podcast the economy of the damned, and and now you're making me wonder if I was a tad optimistic. Um, from from that intro, that that macroeconomic backdrop that we have, my first question is actually the government has recently brought in some tax cuts and that they're much better than the original stage three tax cuts which were proposed but do you think they will have much effect at all on supporting consumer demand in australia yeah they'll certainly have some impact i mean obviously if we're going to hand back i think it's uh, with 1200 dollars a year or something like that so like yep. yeah on average it's you know that's obviously disposable income but it's important to point out that the federal government's really only just giving back, you know, a little bit of the bracket creep that it's taken over the past few years. So Australians actually incurred one of the biggest increases in personal income tax, uh, you know, payments as a percentage of income in the past year or so. Uh, because, you know, some other countries, like, for example, the US, they index their personal income tax scales to inflation. In Australia, we don't do that. And... We also cancelled the lower lower middle income tax offset. So those two things, high inflation, uh, which has caused bracket creep, as well as the cancellation of the lower middle income tax threshold, led to a record increase in the proportion of household incomes that was handed over as tax receipts. And the stage three tax cuts basically give a little bit of that back. The problem the Australian tax system has long term is that it's becoming increasingly reliant. It already is amongst the most reliant in the world of personal income taxes but it just continues to become more and more reliant on personal income tax receipts. And the reason for that is that all the other areas of taxation, so you're talking about indirect taxes like GST, fuel excise, et cetera, are shrinking as a proportion of the economy. And they're shrinking because in the case of the GST, it excludes things like, uh, you know, healthcare spending, education spending, et cetera, which comprise, which are, which are the areas that are growing the fastest in expenditure. Yeah. And then in terms of indirect taxes like fuel excise and, you know, alcohol excise, et cetera, but especially fuel excise, um, because of more efficient vehicles and because of electrification of vehicles, et cetera, the government's collecting less re less revenue there. So as, as a result, it's becoming more and more concentrated and more aligned on personal income taxes. Are you and concerned this, about the prospect of a decline in r revenue royalties in particular, the iron ore, the coal, the gas, and the possibility that they may shrink reasonably quickly, presumably not by the end of this year, but certainly within, say, five to ten years, certainly for coal, maybe for iron ore, and potentially even for gas. Does that is that a concern as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we've obviously had a, a global commodity boom, which is going to come off. We've also got the global shift away from these sorts of resources. And, you know, some of that is also self-inflicted. So Martin Ferguson, who was the uh, former energy minister under the Rudd-Gillard government, he changed the petroleum resource rent tax to make it, you know, more generous. And as a result, we now collect less, less revenue from that today than we did, you know, 15 years ago, despite the fact that we're exporting way more gas. So we have these structural declines in all these areas. So all the forms of indirect taxes, resource taxes, et cetera, uh, partly because the, you know, the, the, the world's going to shift away from these things. Uh, we're we're going to go X boom. So obviously we had a massive uh, commodity price boom, which is going to reverse because of China, et cetera. Um, and then also, obviously, we've structurally messed up the design of these taxation systems, which is just going to make us more and more Relying on personal income taxes at the same time as Australia's population is ageing and the share of workers in the economy is going to shrink just because of that population ageing. So, so it's really set up a, you know, a dynamite situation for Australia at the same time as our expenditures are growing through things like the NDIS. 
which today costs just over $40 billion, but the parliamentary budget office projects that it could cost up to $100 billion in around a decade. And all this stuff's got to be paid for. And unfortunately, the federal government's solution to this is just to keep taxing workers more and more through bracket creep and all these other things, while the actual base of workers continues to shrink. And I think this is one of the reasons why the federal government is so intent on running a mass immigration policy, because it's an easy way just to bring in taxpayers, right, which obviously causes problems in all these other areas like housing and infrastructure and the environment, et cetera, when the optimal solution is to fix the tax system, and in particular, to tax resources properly, like they do in places like Qatar and Norway, et cetera. That's the solution, but they're not willing to do the hard solution. So instead, they just want to keep running the same economic model, just bring in more people, try and keep the uh, personal income tax receipts coming in to try and band-aid over all the lost revenue that they've got. Can I just chime in there with two thoughts? The first one is the we are at the initial stage of the widespread uptake of artificial intelligence. In the largely services economy, which Australia has outside the resources, would you expect AI to have a very significant effect? It depends. So obviously there's there's the sorts of roles which are people servicing. So, you know, there are people who deliver your food and uh, clean your house and make your coffees, etc. Obviously, AI can't do those things. But it can wipe out jobs in the sort of lower level analytical roles. And uh, so certainly it's going to have an impact, whether it's uh, net negative, positive, et cetera. We don't really know. I mean, obviously, it's pretty scary. You can, th you can, th you can see a whole bunch of roles that will be eradicated from it. Um, you know, again, more of those lower level analytical roles, uh, even up to middle management, could, could become eradicated by it. So, for example, your paralegals, all those sorts of things. You don't need to hire those people when you can, when AI can do a lot of the work for you. Exactly. And, and uh, even things like bookkeeping and basic accounting and a lot of administrative work in public sector environments and in administrative environments like banks and insurance companies, there would need probably need to be factored in a potentially significant impact of AI uptake in all of those. But the next question that I wanted to put to you, if we assume that there is also the, the AI factor looming just ahead of us, the berg in the water, if you like, the bringing in of as many migrants as we've done in the last couple of years brings on board the additional risk that they're effectively jumping onto the Titanic. Absolutely. And, and, and look, look, this has been the problem Australia's had for a long time. So. Australia's got the greatest population by 8.3 million people this century. It's an incredible amount of, amount of you know, it's an incredible number. We're, we're under, just under 19 million at the turn of the century. And now we're just over 27 million. And the, one of the main reasons why we've done this is because of so-called skills shortages. So in 2001, the former Howard government uh, held a summit in Canberra and, and uh, a, a committee in Canberra which was attended by the Australian Industry Group, the Business Council, Australian Com uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And they concluded at the time that Australia was facing a growing skill shortage and the solution to that skill shortage was to import a whole bunch of migrants to fill those skill shortages. Well, they went ahead and did that. And as I just said, the population's grown by 8.3 million people, and yet we've got world worse skill shortages than ever. And the reason for that is because Australia, Australia's migration system is basically a whack-a-mole system. So it identifies you know, potential skill shortages in one area. It tries to solve that by bringing a whole bunch of people to work in that area. They often don't work in that area. And then it creates skill shortages in other areas. So the latest one at the moment is we have this massive shortage of homes because we've imported all these people, 2 million people in two calendar years. Sorry, 1 million people in two calendar years. And the solution now being put forward is we need to import a whole bunch of builders to build those homes. Problem with, so, you know, they're probably doing that. So, so say Australia imported half a million builders, right, to solve the housing crisis. Well, then you're just going to create shortages in healthcare because those people are going to need to see doctors and nurses and all that sort of stuff. They're going to have children or they will come over with children. They're going to need schooling. So you're going to have shortages in teachers. You're going to have shortages in basically every area that those people need in their life. So then the solution then Starting will be... with housing, which they're coming to address. That's it. So they come in... Bring in half a million people to build houses, those people need houses. 
So the whole thing's a, you know, a, a, a virtuous dog chasing your tail system whereby you try and solve one problem and then you create shortages in other areas and then you try and solve that by bringing more migrants, then you create more shortages and it just goes around the circle. And that's effectively the system Australia's ran for 20 odd years, whereby again, we've grown the population by 8.3 million people. It's extraordinary numbers. And yet we've got worse skills shortages than ever. And all this tells you is that it doesn't work. And that, unfortunately, you know, has been the Australian story. And, and, and now we're going to overlay that into a potential AI shock with, uh, you know, AI, AI labour shock, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, there isn't any appetite to change the system and to try and make it, you know, if not smaller, at least, well, both smaller as well as better targeted and more high skilled. I'll hold you or right there. We'll come back to that very thought. From that point, however, Let's just look at the short term, bearing in mind that we have an election presumably by May of next year. Do you see any prospect of a significant uptick in sentiment about Australia's economy between now and say next May? Maybe a little bit of an improvement, but it's still going to be pretty bad. So I think we can pretty much kiss goodbye to the notion that rates were going to rates are going to come down in the second half of this year. I've been, I think, late last year I started calling that, thinking that we'd get a rate cut in the second half of this year. Um, it's still possible, but we need a lot of things to go. No, we don't we need a, you know, the inflation rate to come down more, obviously, as well as a substantial weakening in the labour market, probably more than what we're going to get. Um, I think it's still going to weaken quite significantly, but I think because inflation has been a bit more sticky, you know, the Reserve Bank probably won't cut rates this year, but, you know, it'll, I don't think it's going to raise rates again. It's probably going to cut them, and cut them but the first cut will probably be early next year now. I'll and because of that... There as well, because one of the points that you've often made is that Australia's inflation problem is probably quite different to many of the other inflation problems that much of the rest of the developed world has, insofar as Australia's inflation is driven by fixed inflation. We need to pay the energy costs, we need to pay for the roads, we need to pay for the transport and the healthcare and the education. It's not discretionary spend which is driving Australia's uh, inflation issue. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so 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 we've termed it elbowflation. So it comes from principally two sources. So one of it's through our insanely high immigration policy. So we're bringing in people at a far quicker rate than we can supply those people, and it's putting up a pressure on price. And the most obvious obvious place where you see that is in the rental market, whereby CPI rents, so that's rents as measured in the consumer price index, are going up about seven and a half percent. And had the Commonwealth government not increased rental subsidies, it would have been close to the nine and a half percent. So we're getting extreme rental inflation. Rents comprise six percent of the CPI basket, so they're putting up a pressure on rents. But also we're seeing it across the whole construct construction sphere. So as we know, all the state governments are embarking on these big build infrastructure projects. They're competing with each other for labour, for materials, etc. It's putting up a pressure on price. The main reason why we, why they're running these big build infrastructure projects is in response. To, to the, the federal government's mass immigration, because obviously, if you're going to bring in, you know, extraordinary numbers of people every year, you need to build out, you need to build infrastructure for them as well as houses. So this is all putting upward pressure on building costs, on rents, on all these sorts of areas. At the same time, as you alluded to at the start, we've also engineered an energy crisis in Australia. So despite the fact that we export over 80% of our gas nationally and more than 70% on the East Coast, on the East Coast at least, where we don't have a domestic gas reservation policy, we're now paying some of the world's highest gas prices. And what that means is that we're also paying some of the world's highest electricity prices because gas is used both to heat our homes in manufacturing, in blast furnaces, etc. But it's also a, a critical input into electricity manufacturing and actually sets the marginal cost of electricity because the way the national energy market works is it takes the highest bid for energy and it applies that across the whole market, the energy price. And because gas is used in what they call firming power, so yeah. whenever there isn't enough renewables or coal to fill all, all your electricity needs, you need gas as the firming fuel because it can be turned on and off very quickly. What that makes, means is that gas is typically your last bid and it's the highest bid because we've got expensive gas prices. 
And what that means is that it's pushed up gas and electricity prices, which is why Australia is suffering from this extreme energy deflation. And that's then pushing up, putting upward pressure on the consumer price index. It's putting upward pressure on cost of living, and it's also sending our manufacturers broke. And all really gets down to the, the uh, our failures in gas policy. And this is why we call it elbowflation, because the federal government has caused these problems to a large degree, because A, it's pumped immigration to record levels deliberately, which has fueled building inflation, fueled rental inflation, and it's also failed to address the energy crisis, which in itself caused when it was, uh, you know, the, the Rudd, Rudd Gillard Labor government caused it when they approved all the gas export terminals in Gladstone without any domestic reservation. The only, we are literally the only gas exporter in the world on the East Coast that does not reserve our gas for domestic use. And as a result, we're stuck paying high international prices. Even though we export more than 70% of our gas on the East Coast, and we should be, and we're an energy superpower. So it is self-inflicted wounds here. Uh, it's and, and it's just, nothing short of madness when you think that every other gas exporter or every other energy exporter ensures that its own people derive an, an actual benefit, a, a competitive advantage from having cheap energy, and Australia simply can't organise itself to do that. It's even worse. I'll, I'll give you an example. So uh, about a year or so ago, the US took, overtook Australia as being the world's biggest gas exporter. And yet, despite being the world's biggest gas exporter, Americans pay about $2.50 US a gigajoule for their gas, which is about $4 Australian. Australians on the East Coast currently pay anywhere, on a good day, it's about $12 a gigajoule. And on a bad, and, and on a bad day, like a few weeks ago, it was $25 a gigajoule. Yeah. So we are paying, you know, triple to six times what Americans pay for the gas. And the reason for that is Americans are smart enough to basically say, look, you've got to supply Americans first, they've got a reservation policy, and they basically regulate the price for that, you know, for, for what Americans pay, and then they export the rest. In Australia, we export it first, and then we allow these foreign-owned gas companies to then gouge us domestically. We don't have a domestic gas reservation policy here. We have a $12 price cap, which is ridiculously high, which isn't it's even effectively a twelve dollar price floor. price floor. That's yeah. right. So 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 the price ends up at the lower end. It's twelve bucks, and then because there's all these exclusions to the cap, but then as we saw two Fridays ago, it went up to twenty five dollars yeah. on the east coast. And this is all this is all through government failure. And another counterpoint is on the west coast in WA, they have a domestic gas reservation policy. They export about eighty five percent of their gas. Yet Western Australians pay incredibly low gas prices and low electricity prices because they have a reservation policy that's been in place since about 2002. And that requires them to reserve 15% of their gas for domestic use. And they also regulate the price. So therefore Western Australians get cheap gas and cheap electricity. Us on the East Coast, we don't do any of that. And we have expensive gas and expensive electricity. It's as simple as that. All we need to do is just copy WA. And ideally, you'd copy WA or the US, and you'd also implement an export levy on your gas. So you can make it either a flat levy of $1 a gigajoule for every gigajoule that you export, or you can make it a, a step system whereby over a certain price, you do like a progressive system where the levy goes up and up. But either way, you know, that, that, that would give Australians a return for uh, resources that have been sold overseas. Because at the moment, we're getting very little return. We're only getting cost because it's effectively driven up the, the gas price from historically about $3 a gigajoule to $12 to $25, which is and what we paid out. So we're actually worse off. Out more than once, some of the markets into which Australia is selling its gas at bargain basement uh, large-scale contract prices is actually being resold by the buyers of that gas into Europe, where it's, a, it's actually providing a benefit a, a windfall uh, on sale to the Chinas and the Koreas and the Japans of this world. And, and look, they're, they're only doing what every you know, trader would do, but Australia isn't getting any advantage from it. It's absolute madness. It is, it is. Can you imagine? So, absolutely. So we're exporting more than they need, the same time as we're starving ourselves of gas. 
and they're basically on selling that gas for profit while we starve ourselves and pay absurdly high prices and they're now, now being threatened with gas shortages. Could you imagine a Saudi Arabian or a Kuwaiti or a, you know, someone from Iran paying $2 a litre for their petrol when their countries export almost all their oil overseas? That's effectively what we're doing, in, doing on the east coast of Australia. It's absurd. Like we, we should have the cheapest energy prices outside of oil. Obviously, I'm not talking about oil here. In the world, because we export all that stuff. We export tons of it. We're one of the world's biggest exporters. But through government failure, we've created a situation whereby we are paying some of the world's highest prices and we've created this artificial shortage. And as a result, we've got high gas, high electricity prices, persistent inflation problems, cost of living pressures, and we're literally making ourselves less competitive on the world stage in manufacturing, et cetera. So all our manufacturers are going broke. And the government's solution, instead of fixing the problems at its core, it wants to spend billions of dollars of our money on its bogus future-made manufacturing policy, which is basically going to create, just, just give out subsidies for us to build a whole bunch of you know, renewable stuff that we'll never be competitive in. So, for example, solar panels. Now, here's a question for you. Australia's last plastics manufacturer, Quinos, closed down about two months ago. It closed down because of high gas prices. It can't afford to compete anymore. And, you know, manufacturing in Australia is uncompetitive. So it closed down. Where is the plastics that goes into those, you know, solar panels, wind turbines, et cetera, going to come from, given that we no longer have a plastics manufacturer because of high energy prices? We're going to have to import that stuff from China. So Elbow's whole you know, future-made stuff is going to end up just being an assembly plan in Australia to assemble stuff that's imported anyway at, at, at huge cost, purely to claim that we've still got a manufacturing sector, when the solution, obvious solution, is to give Australian manufacturing cheap energy like they have in America, and then we might actually be competitive and they can stand on their own two feet without government subsidies. We it's might absurd. actually grow our own sort of manufacturing without government mandates behind it all. Can I just cut back a little bit there? Your current thinking, it is that we probably won't get an interest rate cut by the end of this year, but what are your thoughts about the possibility the RBA may even actually increase? I think it's pretty slim. So the reason why I think that is, um, so basically since, since the so-called shocker may you know, CPI indicator report, whereby, you know, Australia's inflation grew by 4% over the month, year on year. Um, you know, it was obviously a big shock and awe, number was worse than expected, et cetera. It wasn't actually as bad as what everyone made out. The, re the reason why it jumped, uh, so inflation actually fell by 0.1% in May. The reason why the annual rate jumped from, I think, 3.6% to 4 was because in the previous year, infl inflation fell even more heavily. So we got what's called the base effect. So... The heavy fall in May last year was replaced by a smaller fall in May this year, and therefore the annual rate rose. In June, we have, I think it's a 0.8% um, rise last year will drop out. So June last year, we had a 0.8% monthly increase that's going to fall out. Yeah. So if we have, say, a 0.3% reading this year, well, inflation is going to drop right back down again. And so basically, look, the, 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 the monthly CPI is very volatile. The Reserve Bank will get the quarterly at the end of this month. That's the thing it's going to look at. The other thing it's going to look at is the June labour market report, which comes out next week. That's expected to be very weak. Uh, based on all the forward-looking and all the industry-type data we've had, it's been an absolute shocker. So the NAB business survey was an absolute wipeout. The latest SEEK employment data, so both job ads and applications per job ad, were an absolute shocker. And the income um, growth figures have been very weak as well. Yeah, everything everything has been weak. So pretty much everything that came, that, that has come out, except for the, the May CPI indicator, has been terrible. Yeah. And because of that, I think when the August meeting comes around next month, um, they'll weigh it up and they go, look, the inflation, the June quarter inflation won't look as bad as the May monthly did. Still not going to be coming down as quickly as they wanted. But... Everyone's got to remember that the Reserve Bank's got two mandates now, and this is legislated now. It's not just price stability, it's also full employment. So they've got to balance the economy with price stability, whereas previously they gave much bigger weight into price stability. It's still important, obviously, and it's probably still their main indicator. But because the, because the economy is 
clearly weakening. It's a lot worse than it was in the March quarter. Uh, the, the June quarter is worse than the March quarter, although we don't have the official GDP numbers out yet. We won't get that till early September. Um, and based on that, I think the RBA is going to hold. But what it does also mean is that they're, they're probably going to be on hold. You know, more like if we did get a rate cut this year, it'll be right at the end of the year, and more likely early next year. They're just going to wait to wait until the until that enough data has come in for them to basically prove that they can cut. Okay, I'll just hold you there, but keep you with the lived experience economy. In Australia, we have uh, very significant levels of private debt. Most of that, as you pointed out, is in Australia's mortgages. Your guess would be that there wouldn't be too much relief between now and, say, early next year. We are starting to see some signs, however, of forced real estate sales. As you mentioned, we've uh, lost some manufacturing plants of late as energy costs have become a factor. At what point do you think we're at risk of a major economic shock simply from the extent to which people close up their own spending and perhaps some of the investment already in play decides, hang on, we can't do this anymore. Yeah, it's and, a good and question. And I'm getting close to that. Yeah, look, it's it's really hard to say. I mean, it, it, it's interesting. The, the Westpac Consumer Sentiment Survey shows that sentiment towards buying a home is amongst the lowest on record. But at the same time, people's price expectations is still incredibly high. So we've got this kind of disconnect. People know housing's a rip-off and, and it's a bad time to buy, but at the same time, they're expecting prices to go up, so they're still buying. Is, is part of the answer to that dynamic you're just touching on there, the house prices, is part of the answer to that the simple extortion of rents? So people are saying, basically, bugger renting, we're going to have to buy whatever we can get. Yeah, basically, so... And I'd argue it's down to this mass immigration we've got. We've basically created the Hunger Games, right? We've created this absolutely terrible structural housing shortage, a rental crisis, because we've imported a million renters in two years, and those people need somewhere to live, and, and we don't have the homes for them. And as a result, we've just created this massive fear of missing out on steroids, as Warren Hogan called it, whereby people don't just think the price is going to rise for the short term. They think that there's a good chance they're going to be up 20% within a few years, which, you know, probably seems unlikely at this stage, given where prices are, but hey, you never know. Um, but that, that's the perception. And then at the same time, as price, they, they think prices are going to keep rising. They're seeing their rents go up. Yeah. They're like, well, geez, I'm, 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 you know, I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. If I rent, I'm going to keep getting shafted by surging rental costs. If I lose my rent, rental uh, tenancy, I'm going to have to go on the private rental market and try and find another one and compete with 100 other people who line up for a listing. It's just a horrible situation to be in. So as a result, people are doing whatever they can to get in the market. So they're borrowing from their parents, they're borrowing from their grandparents, they're doing whatever they can to get in there. They're, 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 they're leveraging to the hill. Average loan sizes have never been bigger. They're more than 600,000. I was looking the other day at their first mortgage data and, and they were talking about an average mortgage now is six more than 600 grand. And yeah. I'm, I'm thinking... On the one hand, I'm thinking that's a ridiculous amount of money for an average full-time income is roughly about just under or just on about 90000 So you think of one income earner paying off that mortgage and they're really going to, if, if there's one person trying to pay that off, but even two people trying to pay that off, they're carving out a massive amount of appaired income to service a mortgage. But the other side of that same dynamic is, look at what you get for more, just over 600000 Not Australia. much. That's yeah. right. And, and, and also, you know, mortgage mortgage repayments have risen about 50% from what they were before the RBA started hiking. So we've got record loan sizes with on mortgage repayments that are about 50% higher than they were before the RBA, RBA started hiking. So, you know, it, it, there's a record gap between capacity to pay and median prices based on, so, you know, generally capacity to pay and median home prices sort of track each other pretty closely. But we've had this huge disconnect in the past two years as prices have rocketed despite the RBA hiking rates. And really, the, the only economist who tipped this, I've got to give my, tip my hat to him, is Stephen Kukulis. Yeah. 
because the rest of us were, 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 were looking at the historical relationship between interest rates and prices and thinking, you know, capacity to pay and prices are closely linked, which they have been forever. But then now they're not. And the reason why they're not is we've had this absolutely ginormous increase in migration that was, you know, way higher than anyone ever expected. And at the same time, we've had a contraction on the supply side of the housing market because of high interest rates, builders going going fast, a 40% increase in materials costs, builders competing for labour against state government infrastructure projects, all these sorts of factors. So it's really been a perfect storm. And if and you think on top of that, that mass immigration and those houses and those mortgages, they're all revolving around an economy with higher levels of non-permanent employment than just about any other economy in the OECD. That's right. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think that's also another reason why the unemployment rate has been really, you know, very low, like artificially low, I'd say, 4%. Um, part of that is because we have a sort of gig economy now whereby anybody can do a couple hours work if they need to. Like, you know, it's never been easy to do a few hours work. Um, you know, you can drive an Uber, you can do a quick food delivery, you can do an air tasker. There's a whole bunch of easy ways to do a little bit of work now you know, fairly easily with the, with apps and things like that. Because of that, people are staying employed more than they would have been in the past because they can do these sorts of things. But it's not secure employment. It's not high-paying employment and certainly not stable employment. And, you know, not, not trying to segue onto something else, but another reason why Australia's unemployment has been so low, uh, well, artificially low, I'd argue, is because of the NDIS. Yeah. So the National Disability Insurance Scheme has counted for most of Australia's employment growth in the last year or so. And we've seen a massive boom in personal carers and uh, those sorts of, uh, you know, that, that sort of employment because of the NDIS. And NDIS linked employment is not linked to the state of the economy. It's not linked to interest rates. It's not linked to the market sector. And as a result, Australia's managed to still create jobs, even though the government supported jobs. Well, the dynamic there, as I see it, is we have created an entitlement for people. As someone who knows people within the NDIS, I'd observe many of those people, you know, they deserve the support that we provide them. But at the other end of that same dynamic, it is funded by the taxpayer. Traditionally, you would have certainly the liberal side or the conservative side of Australian politics would almost always run oh, let's get rid of um, public sector spending or let's tone it down and let's get rid of waste. And uh, they tend to prefer uh, tax cuts uh, for personal payers of tax. But their scope for actual government outlays, it's now significantly anchored into NDIS in a way in which it wasn't, say, 30 years ago or 20 years ago. And it now rivals the military in terms of a public sector outlay. So we are going to be picking up the tab for that one way or another for quite some time. But once again, it sort of just reinforces a bubble. Uh, it's an economy created by a bubble of government outlays with the government harvesting the royalties from the commodity exports. It leaves us at massive risk if we lose those commodity exports either price or volumes, but we we really are anchored in to a lot of very, very significant outlays, even more if you think we're building the infrastructure to fit in all the people that we're bringing in. To bring all that back to the discussion of right now, do you see either side of Australian mainstream politics proposing any significant change to that in the lead up to the next election? Yeah, probably not in the, to lead up next election, but um, yeah, certainly there's, there's a few things to touch upon there. So the government share of the economy has never been higher. So Westpac did some great analysis of the of the national accounts as of the March quarter and showed that I think 27.3% of Australia's GDP came from public expenditure or public demand, which was a record high. And that's basically two things that, that have driven that. It's obviously the NDIS, you know, the massive increase in expenditure there. So as I said, it's just over $40 billion last year. And then at the other, uh, the other side of the coin, we also had obviously the state government big build infrastructure projects so that are the other key driver. 
So I've got all the state governments around the country basically trying to trying to build all these massive, big infrastructure projects, belatedly trying to catch up with all the population growth we've had and expected future population. And that's pretty much what's driving the economy. But as you touched upon, the NDIS is predicted to just keep growing. And the parliamentary budget office, as I alluded to earlier, projects that the NDIS in a decade is going to cost about $100 billion a year, which is going to be basically the same as the age pension. So we're effectively going to have two age pensions running side by side. Obviously, NDIS isn't the age pension, but in terms of scope, if you imagine that. And that's going to need to be paid for. And look, look, I, full disclosure, I've got a son on the NDIS. He's severely autistic, um, you know, disabled. Yeah. And, you know, look, it, it's been a great help, but I do see a lot of problems with the NDIS structure. So the way I see it, it's, you know, as they, what, what's the old saying? The, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I think that's kind of the case with the NDIS. It's, it was a great idea, except unfortunately it's been, it's been set up to fail. The way the whole system is set up to fail. Um, uh, my opinion is that it, to some extent it's been set up in such a way as it's harvested almost by some very large capital interests. Yeah, that's it. it look, it has been pri it's basically a privatised system. So I'll just give an example. The, and, and, and this is just my own personal experience. So before the NDIS came out, uh, my son went to a, a, a bunch of you know state-run programs at uh, various agencies. And the way these programs were funded was through block funding, which I'd argue is way more, you know, um, is way more efficient. So, for example, they had these, you know, the, these, uh, these charity sort of places that would run things for disabled people. And they'd receive a set amount of funding every year from the government. They'd then go and employ a whole bunch of staff who'd be on there as permanents, you know, just work as employees. And they'd run services, and it seemed to work really well. The NDIs came along and basically said, no, no, you can't do that. We're going to give all the money to the individual who's then going to manage their own uh, their own expenditure, or we're going to give it to agents of those people. And what it's meant is that now you have a whole bunch of private um, organisations, et cetera, who now just contract out their services to people who don't really know how much this stuff should cost don't really, you don't really care. You go, oh, okay, I'm going to book, you know, a OT session, whatever. And these OTs, for example, might charge an enormous amount of money, which is way more than they would have charged previously or they should charge. But you as the buyer doesn't know how much this stuff should charge. And then at the same time, the amount of bureaucracy to get on the NDIS and all the box tickers and all the other stuff. So every time you need something, you've got to go to a pediatrician and spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars for them to write a letter which is then paid for by the NDIS to then submit to the NDIS. So it, it has just created this whole, um, you know, bureaucratic process with a bunch of middlemen, and then and then of course we've had a whole bunch of rotors and you know non non genuine actors who've just seen it as a huge money pot uh, to to defraud the system, and then now we've it's gotten so extreme that now private equity firms and billionaires are trying to move in and buy up NDIS providers because they see that it's an enormous pot of money on, you know, available. And, and this isn't the system that we wanted or deserve. Some and of just, that uh, private equity has been in there right from the get-go. I recall yes. looking at some service providers who you couldn't get data from in Australia, but if you looked at parent companies based in London, I recall in one particular instance, I certainly won't name the company, I recall looking in a corporate report out of the UK highlighting the fact that their Australian uh, operations were expanding massively with the NDIS, which is providing top-line revenue growth for these guys in the UK. And I, I recall thinking, oh, hang on, that's, um, that's the Australian taxpayers being harvested there. Yeah, it is. And, and, and look, you know, this isn't the first time this has happened. We saw it when they tried to privatise vocational education and training. We got a whole bunch of dodgy VET companies open up and defrauded the taxpayer of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, right? Because a huge honeypot opened up. They tried to create a privatised system whereby it was done on good faith, whereby you could set up as a private vocational education provider and then, you know, get a whole bunch of people to study your courses and end up just with a whole bunch of ghost colleges who just scam the taxpayer 
We saw it with Pink Bats. We saw it with childcare subsidies. So there was a few dodgy players that came in that uh, came in there and defrauded the taxpayer of money as well. So the whole system is because it's been set up as sort of a private system. It's it was always going to fail, and unfortunately, that's exactly what's happening. And it's and and unlike those other programs, this the NDIS is just ginormous, and it does do. Yeah, you know, look, I'm not going to not going to lie. It does a lot of good. But it does a lot of good at enormous cost, and it should be doing the same amount of good at a lot much lower cost and more efficiently. Yeah. And the other problem is, I, I I always hear from people who do have genuinely disabled um, children or partners, whatever, and they're not and they can't get on the NDIS because they, for some reason, they're being blocked by a, a box ticker. But then you hear other stories of people who are barely disabled getting funding. Yeah. So it, it's just that the, the system as it's been set up is is bloated, it's inefficient, it's got too many middlemen, it's designed to, to be rorted, and that's exactly what's happening. And I'd argue that the system that we had before the NDIS was probably better, whereby a whole bunch of you know charities for the disabled existed, and they just received annual block funding from the federal government, from state governments, et cetera. They got you know audited by those agencies, by the federal government or state government, to keep their licenses. And they just got block, block funding whereby they employed permanent staff on proper permanency. And they just worked as employees. And that that system to me worked fine. And I don't know, but now I've got an NDIS system. For me, for me personally, you know, it, we, we initially had a really bad experience with the NDIS because my son basically got shafted. But then after appeals and going to getting a whole bunch of reports written and going through an appeals process, he's now on a decent plan. But I'm not. I wouldn't argue it's better than the plan he had before the NDIS. You know, it wasn't really a plan. He just go to these, these. You know, he qualified. He went in there. and go. They said to me, "Yeah, he's disabled. He can do this. Um, do this program. You know, whether it's a sheltered workshop or whatever." And I'd argue that the system's not really any better, but it's a lot more convoluted now, and it's a lot more costly, and there's a lot more middlemen involved. To bring us back to the macroeconomic discussion. In order to sustain these these very significant outlays, Australia needs to probably restructure its economy to develop some facet of its economy which can earn an income from offshore and be competitive. Do you see any sign of either side of politics taking steps along that path? No, no. So one of the areas where they're where they've obviously led, uh, linked into, and that claim is a so-called export area, is international education. Yeah. So it's you know it's always touted as Australia's third biggest export or fourth biggest. You know, it always changes third or fourth. Which is a complete joke of us. It is. It's complete farce. Yeah. So I say it's worth over forty billion dollars a year, and it's one of our biggest. You know, so biggest export we don't dig out of the ground, whatever. The truth of the matter is, it's completely fake. So it, it, it's it's. It's a made-up export. It's a made-up figure, and unfortunately, the, the Australian Bureau of Statistics is behind the budgery. And the reason why it's made up is they effectively assume that any dollar that's spent by an international student while they're a student in Australia is an export, which is just absurd. When you consider that most of the students that come into Australia come from poor, poor nations, they're from South Asia, etc. And they're they don't sustaining come themselves here by employment here. That's it. That's it. And and look, even if they, you know, borrow money and they pay for themselves initially, they tend to have to repay that money back home anyway. So they borrow a family and relatives and loan sharks, et cetera. Yeah. And then once that money is repaid, so it comes in, might come in as a temporary export, but then when it's repaid, it's an import. So it nets out anyway. And, you know, migrants in general, we don't know exactly what the breakdown is between students and overall migrants, but you know, Australia sends a lot far more remittances overseas than we receive from overseas. So we have a massive outflow in remittances from migrants in Australia sending money back home. And that's an import. And we don't account for that. And so so this whole $40 billion figure that the ABS touts and the education industry and the government and everyone says it's one of our major imports, it's paying for everything, it's paying for schools, and it's complete garbage. It's not. Um, there would be some import, so there would be some export figure there, but not much. Uh, Chinese students would be more likely to be um, exports because they tend to work 
less when they're here, but pretty much students from all the other countries, they're not exports yet. Uh, the, way, the way it's counted is if, if you're a foreign student who comes over here and you rent a house, which you pay for by working over here, that rent is an export. So we're actually exporting rent. Can you believe that? <laughs> While, whilst we create a rental crisis, this is how absurd the situation is. And, and the whole figure that they, you know, international students are the only classification of migrants that are classified as exports while they're here. So if you're a temporary, if you're another form of temporary migrant and you work in Australia, that's not counted as an export. But for some reason, we've made the designation that if you're a student, you are an export. So, you know, you can come over here from Nepal with very little money in your bank account. So, you know, to, to, to now meet the requirements to get a student visa, you've got to show that you've got $27,000, I think it is in your bank account, maybe it's 28 now. It was 20, not so long ago. Well, you, you don't have to put in an escrow or a trust account or something and then withdraw from it. You just got to show you got it in your bank account. And they'll give you the visa, you come over here. And then you can just take the money back out. Um, so you, you can come over here with a couple thousand bucks to see you through your first few weeks, then get a job and then sustain yourself from that job. And for the whole time that you're, every, every dollar you spend is purportedly an export. Even if you're working, driving Ubers, whatever, cafes, doing cleaning jobs, et cetera, you're earning your money in Australia, but any of that expenditure from the ABS is an export. It's just absurd. It's, it's like, it's like if uh, if my daughter moves out of home when she hits university age and works at Kmart or something and, you know, pays her rent, you know, rents a house with a share house. All that money that she's spending isn't an export. She's earning at Kmart and doing some other stuff. But if you're an, but if, but if she classified herself as an international student, if that was possible, suddenly that would become an export. export. Yeah. That is how absurd the situation is here. Well, and if you think for vast amounts of Australian Australians living in suburbs, they would be far more likely to be telling their children, well, make sure you're doing a university course close to where you live and have grown up right now because you're better off staying with mum and dad in the bedroom you've lived in rather than trying to rent a house anywhere. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I can't afford to anymore. It's not like, not like when I was growing up in the 90s where sharing a, you know, a, a share house at university was pretty common and it didn't cost much. Now it's just, you know, it's extortionate. You can't afford to do it. So, um, yeah, that, that's the only area where Australia seems to be leveraging into on the, on the export front. It's not even a real export. Unfortunately, and unfortunately, the areas that we are competitive in, we seem to want to give them up. So it's or just... we've uh, already given them up. That's right. Yeah, or already have given them up. But also, you know, we, we seem to not want to develop any more gas fields. We don't want to do anything like that, which I think is absurd. I think we need more gas. We need more. We should be... We should be leveraging that even harder, but we just need to make sure that when we do that, we have domestic reservation. And ideally, I would love to see us go back to the future and have government-owned, uh, you know, gas gas companies go in there and develop new resources and have them as government-owned. They can compete against the foreign-owned ones, and they can supply us with cheap domestic gas domestically. That brings us back to a more strategic um, focus, if you like. If we assume that neither side of Australian politics is likely to propose that in going into the next election or even the election after, if we assume that. Um, but the question then at some level becomes, at what point does the current setup we have become unsustainable we seem to we're, we're almost um, force feeding ourselves migrants to grow the economy, which, as you say, rests upon some very flawed assumptions. Is what is an export earn? But it also relies upon us continuing to being able to sell volumes at whatever price we can get. But even even more than that, in a world where there's an even bigger focus on carbon neutrality we are clearing land and creating more suburbs, blowing our entire carbon neutral credentials out of the water, while we quite rightly are relatively squeamish about the, the carbon implications of our coal exports. But gas at least is a transitional fuel. So you would assume that there's at least some wiggle room in terms of developing gas fields. 
Can yeah, you, well, I mean, can you to... see either side of Australian politics, or or can you see a point where we we are simply forced to do something to develop it? Look, well, one of the worst things about Dutton's pivot into nuclear is that the solution is staring him right in the face. He should have so, just gone yes. hard on gas, yeah. gone hard on gas, both on domestic reservation, on export levies to smash the gas cartel. So, you know, Dutton's out there at the moment saying he wants to break up the supermarkets because they're a cartel. It's like, Peter, we have a, a much more egregious and vicious problem right now with the gas cartel, yeah. who's completely robbing the east coast of gas while they flog it offshore in the cheap. And, you know... Create, uh, drive enough energy prices at home and create an artificial shortage and not pay much tax. Like that is the cartel you should be going after. And it's, it's, it is so important. As I said before, the gas price sets both the gas price, obviously, but also the electricity price. And the whole thing is you can't have a transition to renewables without gas because renewables are intermittent by nature. So we're currently in Melbourne. It's a pretty, sorry, currently in winter. I live in Melbourne. It's a pretty nasty winter we've got, short days, not much wind in winter. So wind power's not great. There's not much solar. So renewables are always going to struggle in winter time in you know the vast majority of Australia. And you we always need gas as the firming power because gas, unlike coal, unlike nuclear, you can, you can, you can turn on a gas turbine very quickly. So whenever you have a shortfall, you can quickly fire up a gas turbine and, and make up the difference. So it is absolutely critical. And we've got to a situation now whereby, because of the gas shortage, we're now extending the life of coal stations, like the Earring Station in New South Wales. The life of that has been extended so that we're going to actually burn more coal because we've created a shortage of gas. And then that's delaying the renewable rollout. And the whole solution is, is we need gas to basically shut down coal, to take the place of coal, and then to be the firming power while we build our renewables. This is exactly, this isn't novel, this isn't new. This is exactly what America is doing. America has actually managed to decarbonise quicker than Australia. What can you believe? If you, if you go go to our world in data, if you, if you don't believe me, anybody who's listening to this, type in the per capita emissions or, of the United States and put them against the, Australia, and you'll see that the per capita emissions of the US have dropped by more than Australia. They were well ahead of us, now they're below us. And the reason for that is that they've replaced their, their coal-fired power generation with gas power generation. They've literally replaced a coal turbine at the same site with a gas turbine. And that has helped them decarbonise. It's also given them the firming power to build out their renewables. We could do the same thing very easily. We've got so much gas in this country. And if it was cheap enough like America, like it is in America, we could easily replace all our coal fire power with gas, which would lower our greenhouse gas emissions overall, our carbon emissions as well as provide us with cheap gas and electricity prices because we'd have cheap electricity via renewables because renewables by nature are very cheap. Like in summertime when the sun's at that, you know, the, the, the electricity price is zero or sometimes negative. It's a problem is when the sun's not on and when the wind's not blowing, you need gas. So at nighttime, you need gas, et cetera. Uh, in wintertime, you need gas even more, obviously, for heating and also for electricity generation because you've got less wind and you've got less sun. So we could, if we literally just replaced, if we had cheap gas and abundant gas, we could shut down all our coal and we could roll out our renewables better because we have gas as the backstop. and We'd have cheap gas and electricity prices. And that's pretty much all Australia needs to do. But unfortunately, we've, we've done the opposite. We've made gas in shortage. We've made it uber expensive, which is now prolonging the life of our coal generation, which is bad for the environment. And we're and it's also it's, it's also stopping the, the renewable. We're we're distributing the impact between. That's right. Sorry, I miss I, I missed that. We're artificially increasing the number of people we need to impact with with that per capita difference between ourselves and the United States. Australia's flooding its economy with migrants, yeah. which which is not. I don't think you and I don't think I or I don't think anyone around macro business is fundamentally anti-migrant for the sake of being anti-migrant. It's about... Too much. It, it's an, yeah, it's an economic, it's a numbers discussion. That's it. Yeah, look, look, um, you, you're quite right. I mean, Australia's, you know, we've got a commitment to be net zero by 2050. It's an absolute farce. Like, for starters, it, there's no such thing as net zero. Come on, let's be honest. 
right? Um, whenever you build a house, it's going to create emissions. Whenever you drive a car, well, it's not necessarily driving a car, but to create, build that car, to build the Tesla, which you're going to drive, is going to create emissions. If you want to fill your house full of white goods and electronics, et cetera, there's emissions that are required to build those things. Yep. Right? This whole notion that we can magically grow and have everything that we like to have and have energy and all this stuff and somehow have zero emissions is just a farce, right? It's not true. It's, not, it's impossible. It's an impossible pipe dream. But it's especially impossible when you want to grow your population as aggressively as Australia is planning to grow its population. So to put that into perspective, the intergenerational report says Australia is going to grow by 13.5 million people in the next 39 years. So we're currently at about 27 million. We're going to go to 40.5 million. That's the equivalent of, of adding the population of Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane combined to Australia's population in just 39 years. Now, what do you think is going to happen when we have those the, the East Coast major capitals added to Australia's population? All those people are going to need cars, they're going to need houses, they're going to need electronics, they're going to need furniture, they're going to need everything else that's, that is required to live. They will also need the solar panels on their roof. Yes. And, All and this the stuff ones that are here emissions. are probably going to need to have replaced the solar panels on their roof by then. That's right. And we're going to need about five and a half million homes net of demolitions. Right? So, you know, to, to house all those extra people. You can't have that without emissions. So anyone who thinks that we're going to magically go to net zero by 2050, which Albo keeps banging the drum on, and all the so-called Greens and all the, all the people who live in this space, they're absolutely deluding themselves. But it, it was never possible in the first place. But it's certainly not going to be possible when the population grows by another 50%, which is the projection. It just is not possible scientifically. It's not possible economically. It's not possible, you know, in any... Intellectually. Intellectually, it's not possible. I actually agree with you 100%, but my bigger concern is not so much about the carbon greenhouse gas issue. It's actually about what those people will do if we've got a 50% larger population. Because if we've got a 50% larger population, we're even more dependent on either... Our, our resources revenues, which we know the world is trying to get out of, continuing to deliver us a, a, a payoff, or we need to become competitive in some way at doing something. And I see absolutely no sign that Australia is actually thinking of doing that. You're right, and you touch on two things there. Um, I'm not sure if you even meant to touch on them, but you have. Uh, is that Australia's economic model is wrong in two ways. So, for example, as you mentioned, we're highly reliant on a fixed endowment of resources for our wealth, and yet we we are diluting that that mineral base by aggressively increasing our population. So the, the projected population increase of 50% in the next 39 years dilutes your mineral base by 50% per capita, right? which means you either got to export 50% more every year at the same price to be just as well off, or you're going to be obviously worse off. At the same time, we don't tax our resources properly like they do in other countries, like Norway and Qatar, et cetera. So we're not getting the benefit from those resources. The only benefit we really get when we sell resources is a little bit of royalties, which, isn't, which is totally undertaxed, as well as obviously corporate taxes. So, yes, we do get some benefit from it, but we don't get anywhere near what we should do. So, you know, a classic example, as I mentioned earlier at the start, we, we collect less than the petroleum resource rent tax today than we did, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah despite the fact we're exporting tonnes of it. Norway, by comparison, they, they charge a tax rate of about 80% on their oil and gas exports. And as a result, Norwegians are sitting on a sovereign wealth fund that's worth about $280,000 US per citizen. They've got a country of about 5.5 million people, about the size of uh, Melbourne plus Geelong. And they are sitting on a sovereign wealth fund. So, so they've basically invested all their oil and gas profits from the taxes they they levy. What Norway into, actually into a pension does with fund that, that invests is overseas. invest the money outside of Norway so they're not inflating the price of things in Norway and the price of Norwegians trying to do something to earn an income. They invest it just about all outside of Norway to continue generating revenues. 
yeah, it's smart. And and and, and they have major share, shareholdings in Microsoft and all these other global com companies. And they do that so they don't put upward pressure on the, uh, is it Norwegian Krona, I think it is? Yep. Yep. Um, so then, then it doesn't make their manufacturing uncompetitive, et cetera. So that's what a smart country does. You know, Qatar does the same similar sort of thing. They they make $30 billion or something from their natural gas revenues every year. They're a small country. They don't pay income tax. They've got free this, free that. Um, you know, they actually run their, their, their gas system. So Qatar exports about the same amount of gas as us. But they run their their system. They you know they they collect a hell of a lot of royalties and taxes from it. And as a result, their citizens make out like bandits. And they're it's provided with all this stuff. That's great. Like you know low incredibly low taxes and free healthcare and free this and free education and all sorts of stuff. Poor we don't do any of that over here. Yeah, we don't do that, mate. We don't do any of that over here. We actually do something even more disturbing than that. If you think, as is reasonably regularly contended, that Oh, Australia's superannuation system creates, it's, it's sort of a, a de facto national sovereign wealth fund. But in Australia's case, much of the investment of the superannuation system is in Australian equities or Australian houses even. And all you're doing is multiplying the risk that the whole system faces if any given part of it falls apart. Like if you think that for example, Transurban or or one of the big Australian listed companies, maybe Telstra or, or one of the banks, is inflated by the number of people with funds in superannuation investing in those companies. All we're doing is multiplying the risk relating to the model we have. Yeah, absolutely. And and also, I mean, you know, the the future fund here is not really big enough to move the dial, but we. Because we invest it locally as well, and I guess you know it puts upward pressure on the Australian dollar. But very, you know, talking tiny amounts, it's not big yeah. enough. It's not like the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund that is massive in comparison to the size of the economy. But um, yeah, the, the, I, I guess the point is that Australia, because we undertax the stuff, and we've got a dumb economic model, we have we're, we're perennially short of tax revenue. The tax revenue that we get is raised through personal income taxes on a shrinking share of of the population, because we've got a shrinking employment base, obviously, as the population ages. And you couldn't, you basically can't design a stupider system. And all Australia really needs to do is try and become a little bit more like Norway. You know, shift, diversify the tax base, broaden it, and make it a lot more based on resources, because that is what we are rich in. We have so much resources, we sell so much of the rest of the world, but we don't get much return from it for, for Australians. And in fact, in the case of East Coast gas, I'd argue that we'd be better off if we never exported it. Yeah. Because we'd at least have incredibly cheap domestic prices like we had before the Gladstone LNG plants opened up. You know, we're paying about $3, $2.50 to $3 a gigajoule for our gas in the East Coast, which meant we had abundant cheap energy. Those and, years you were talking about when you were a university student, and indeed when I was a university student, we did have cheap gas, very, very cheap gas. And in and, and Sydney and Melbourne of that era had some of the world's cheapest energy. Yeah. I mean, I, look, 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 I remember even in um, when I bought my first house in Melbourne in 2006, uh, we had you know, some really cold winters and, and I had two, you know, a, a, a baby and a, or a three-year-old and a one-year-old or something like that. And we... We're all at home, and I was just started working at home for macro business. And oh, sorry, this is before that, but um, up until when I moved to a macro business full time, we'd run we'd run the gas duct at heating all winter, and you know you'd turn it off at night, but you'd run it all day long, etc. You'd pay like four hundred dollars max at the worst time in winter. You'd pay four hundred dollars for two months. Now, if I was to do the same thing now, it'd be like two thousand dollars. Oh yeah, you'd be getting creamed. Yeah. So so as a result. Um, I barely run my gas at home in Melbourne now. We wear ski jackets around the house. We freeze. I run a few space heaters occasionally in my office, et cetera. They're all do doors shut, but it's pretty pretty miserable. And this is because we've decided to export it all overseas to China. So China can burn our gas. And, and the ridiculous thing about this is that while Victorians particularly, but Australians have been told they've got to get off gas to meet net zero, which is never going to happen anyway, we actually use more gas in Australia. We use way more gas in Australia, converting it to liquid, 
because that's incredibly energy intensive. Yep. So the LNG plants to, to convert the, the gas from gas to liquid to put on a big ship, you use more gas in that process than the entire households of Australia use burning gas to, for heating and for you know cooking and for the you know the hot water etc. This is the absurdity of it. We are being told that we have to get off gas domestically at home to meet net zero and save the save the environment, etc. Meanwhile, the gas exporters are using more gas to convert it to liquid to then st stick it on a pressure ship to then ship it halfway across the world to China and Japan so that they can then burn our gas at, at a cheaper cost than we pay. That is the absurdity of the situation we've got here in Australia. It is we are we are ruled by muppets. It's as simple as that. And this whole net zero delusion is helping to fuel this. We're, we are literally being told you are not allowed to burn gas because it's bad for the environment, it's bad for emissions. While we use, while we burn more of it, turning it into liquid so that China and Japan and Korea can burn our gas instead. It's okay. absurd. Okay, I'll try and bring us back to a discussion of those muppets. The first question I'd ask is, okay, you and and many people suggest that we need taxation reform of some sort with before we go to a discussion about how much enthusiasm politically there's likely to be for that what sort of taxation reform do you think we need to be looking at okay first of all uh i'd, I'd be taxing minerals properly yep so uh, not just super profits taxes but that sort of thing but also you know export levies like i mentioned on on gas for example and yep uh, you know, coal, coal and iron ore, etc. Um, super profits taxes. That'd be number one. Number two is I broaden the GST. I mean, pe people, people often I, I get eggs thrown at me whenever I say we've got to raise the GST, but why not? Like uh, lift the GST to fifteen percent. Um, I'd do that, and in exchange, I'd cut uh, and obviously negative gearing reform and all that sort of stuff. Of course. Do, how serious do you think things like the uh capital gains tax concession and negative gearing reform, how fundamental do you think they are still? Uh, look, it's definitely worth doing. I, th I think the, um, I think you should do one or the other. Oh, well, yeah, potentially both. I think, I think both should be done. Uh, both, both to obviously improve the rate of home ownership. It'll have a, it'll dampen price rises. I don't think it'll make prices fall necessarily or, or not by much. Like, I don't think it's, uh, look, Put it this way, I don't, I don't think curing, doing the negative gearing and capital gains taxes is going to be a magic bullet to suddenly make housing affordable. I think it'll have a pretty marginal impact on prices. It'll probably stop some upward pressure, etc. But what it will do, it'll, it'll improve the rate of home ownership. Yeah. So we've kind of seen a little bit of what could happen in Victoria. So for all, uh, for all Dan Andrews and Jacinta Allen's faults, when there are many, their, their taxes on property investors has stifled investor demand in Victoria. And what's happened is that we've seen a whole bunch of investors sell up in Victoria and they're, they're basically being replaced by first home buyers. So Victoria's had a sort of shift away from investors to first home buyers. But I think that's a good thing. And, you know, we could replicate that nationally through the you know, negative gearing, capital gains taxes, et cetera. So yeah, you should do that. Um, lift the GST. Yeah. Personally, I think we should do that 15% and in exchange cut personal income taxes a lot. But to touch on that very point you've just made, if, like myself, you tend to the view that Victoria is probably closer to the economic precipice than any other state, simply through lack of access to the resources revenues, do you think it's likely to be quite some time before other states start to tinker around with uh, taxes on investors in housing? or speculators, as we can think of them. But at the same time, both sides of mainstream Australian politics, and presumably every state, they're terrified of the prospect of a nation leveraged as Australia is to housing. They're terrified of the prospect of actual real estate price falls. How do you see us trying to evolve out of that cul-de-sac, if you like? Yeah, so um, I can't see the major parties taking much action on negative gearing and capital gains taxes because of that. And yeah, you know, the reason for that is we saw what happened when uh, Bill Shorten tried to do it. Um, and 
it's probably not a great time to do it at the sort of peak of a housing market either because people will be worried. You know, we've had a whole bunch of people who've just dived in, dived into property, they've leveraged to the hilt. The last thing they want to do is be left with massive negative equity. The best time to do it's probably at the bottom of the cycle. Um, so I don't think I don't think now's now would be the time to do it, unfortunately, you know, from a political perspective. Yeah. It's the sort of thing that should have happened years ago. Uh, but uh yeah, I mean, I can't see politicians being willing to go down this road anyway because we see it all the time with, uh, you know, with housing and immigration, et cetera. It's always painted as the solution is not always the one pointing them in the face. It's always they try and gaslight on something else. So, yeah. you know, it's a supply problem rather than being excessive immigration problem, you know, when it comes to rents, et cetera. They always try and, you know, point to an area that's going to not see prices fall. It, at best, it might just see prices rise a little bit more slowly because that's more political. You know, they, they, can, they can call it an affordability measure when it's not really an affordability measure. And that, that's why we constantly see state, state governments and federal governments, et cetera, always pump the demand side through first home buyer subsidies, all those sorts of things, help to buy, all these other ones they do. It's because it's, you know, it's a way to, quote, unquote, improve affordability when you don't actually improve affordability, when you're just really pushing up prices. You're just making... Um, making it easier for certain cohorts of people to buy by reducing their, say, deposit requirements, etc. Probably making it easier for those who have parents who are affluent enough to help support their housing purchases, their desired housing purchases. That's right. So yeah, look, it, it's it's not it's it's a political play. It's not a you know genuine affordability play. And do you see anything at all changing that dynamic? Not really. Look, I mean, you know, for all their faults, and they have many, and I can't stand them, uh, the, the Greens at least are on a, a plane politics cleverly uh, with, you know, trying to pretend that they're on the renter side, even though they support ginormous immigration, even more than yeah. Labor and Liberals. Uh, and, you know, but, but by them sort of hearkening on about rent freezes, et cetera, which are completely un are ridiculous, the notion of it. Um, there at least... If you look at rent freezes and rent caps in other global cities, they just become a trading mechanism. That's it. But the, but the other thing is, it's like, come on, you know, are you going to freeze mortgages then? Yeah. Because if you're an investor and your mortgage rate's gone up and your mortgage repayment's gone up 50%, well, of course you're going to try and recapture some of that back in rents. That's just the way it works. So you, so you can't say, oh, you've got to, you, you know, you're not allowed to increase rents, but all your costs have got to go up. So your insurance costs and all the other costs that are involved when you own a, own a property. So, you know, it's just, it, it, it's, it's typical window dressing, whereby they want to pretend that it's crocodile tears. They're, they're pretending to be concerned at the same time as whenever anybody suggests moderating immigration, they squeal racism. Yeah. And they try and argue that, right, that immigration's, got nothing to do with the rental crisis when it's got everything to do with the rental crisis. So, you know, for, for all their faults, the, the, the Greens at least been smart politically in that uh, we have a growing base of renters in this country because houses have become less and less affordable and young people have basically been forced to become lifelong renters. And the only, pol only political party that's pretending to be on the side, even though they're not really on the side, is the Greens. So as a result, they're going to go to the Greens because they're at least pretending to care about them whereas the others don't even pretend to care. Well, it even gives them a short-term benefit if you think, okay, that my housing aspiration to rent is going to be supported in some way, whereas it would seem to me that neither the Labor Party or the Liberal Party is meaningfully committed, and I don't think the Greens are either, but... I, they're not meaningfully committed to getting more Australians owning more Australian houses. They, they fundamentally just don't seem to want to address the issue, which is a, actually a massive societal transformation for a country like Australia, which has historically had quite a high level of home ownership. And it's also going to pressure the retirement system because the retirement system is built on the notion that people, that the vast majority of people own their homes. Oh, so, so you end up having that security in retirement. So the, the way Australia's retirement system is set up is that it assumes that people, you know, buy a house when they're young, they have a mortgage, they pay it off by the time they get old, and then they can live off, you know, 
well, ideally superannuation or the, or the age pension. But if you've got a big mortgage at the end of it or you're renting, your security retirement's very poor. And, you know, if people are carrying big mortgages into their retirement, they're going to use their super money to pay off that mortgage, which means they won't have nest egg anymore. They're going to fall back on the age pension. Yep. Alternatively, if they don't own a home and they're renters, they're more likely to, well, they're going to be uh, saddled with paying rents for their, for their retirement years, which is going to drain their retirement incomes. At so that point, a, can I get you to tell us what you think about the superannuation system? I think when superannuation was first brought in by Paul Keating in the late 1980s, it was supported by the then ACTU of Bill Kelty, and the idea was to create a pension system supplement to take Australia's aged, to some extent, off the burden of taxpayers. So it was to make people, to nudge people into providing for themselves in some way. And on that basis, I've always pretty much supported it. But in the years since, it's become more of a wealth management system, which encourages people with affluence and with disposable income to minimise taxation. Now we're into the mid 2020s. I find myself wondering if superannuation actually makes any sense at all for people let's say under about 50 years of age and it, the question arises okay should we be just starting to look at giving the money back to younger people or how do we encourage younger people to actually think okay there's something in this system for me so that it either provides a meaningful comfort in retirement in their case, 30, 40 years away, or should we simply be saying to them, hang on, it no longer makes sense for you guys, but somehow you're going to have to provide for yourselves. What are your thoughts about the super system? Yeah, I, I think it's a, basically a tax, tax dodge for the rich. Yeah. Quite frank. I, I don't think it's efficient. Um, the cost of running the super system is enormous if you look at the fees that, that we pay, uh, as opposed to, say, running the age pension system, which is very cheap by comparison. You know, just think about all the middlemen and everything that, or all the people who work in superannuation, you know, whether you're asset managers, whatever. That's probably thousands of people, um, you know, across all the different areas of it. And that's all overhead. Uh, and obviously the way the tax, the tax concessions are set up, they're obviously there to basically favour the rich. So as a result, most of the tax concessions go to people who are never going to go on the age pension anyway. Yeah. Because they're they're wealthy, they're high income earners, etc. Um, look, if I could go in a DeLorean and go back in time, I would have never allowed the superannuation system to have come into place. And instead, I'd replace it with a universal style pension, whereby once you get to a certain age, you get a basically a universal basic income type payment. Which is, which above a certain, which, which, which once your income's above a certain level, you just get taxed at a marginal rate, which is kind of what they have in New Zealand. Yeah. The reason why I'd go for that system is the age pension. Uh, Australia has very poor labour force participation amongst retire age people because people don't want to work because they'll lose the age pension. So it becomes a huge disadvantage to working once you hit 65 or 67, whatever it is now. Yeah. Uh, because you, you got this very high effective marginal tax rate. Whereas New Zealand has a very high, uh, you know, rate of labour force participation amongst older people because they have a, a basically a universal basic income whereby everyone gets paid it regardless of whether you work or not once you get to a certain age. It's not means tested, et cetera. Yeah. But if someone decides to take on extra work, they just get taxed, which I think is a much better system. And I think that's what Australia should have done because the cost of superannuation concessions now is – getting up to, towards rivaling the age pension anyway. It's, it's very, huge. very significant. And That's right. So, so, effectively, Go on. so effectively, Australia's got three things. It's got the NDIS, which is enormous. It's got superannuation concessions, which is enormous. And then it's got the age pension, which is enormous. And I'd argue that two of those things, superannuation concessions and uh, the NDIS, shouldn't be nearly as big as what they are. Um, it's because of this sort of inefficiency in the, the way that they're set up to fail. And the question at that point, to me at least, becomes one of, okay, regardless of whether you think they're, they're valuable or not, 
the, the question at my, my end is, hang on, what happens if Australia finds itself in a straightened macroeconomic like uh, situation? Just say we end coal, we nearly end gas, and China decides to buy all of its iron ore from um, North Africa. At that point, Australia has major, major problems. Well, and yeah, well, the whole what, what... sustainability of all those things you're talking about, those outlays, comes into question. Yeah, well, I mean, what does Australia then sell to the rest of the world? Yeah. I mean, you, you know, yeah, okay, you can sell fake education, which is really immigration. But again, that doesn't generate any genuine export earnings. And it has that's a massive just, carbon impact. That's it. And, and obviously, livability impact and everything else. Like, you know, um, under current projections, uh, I live in Melbourne. Melbourne's population is projected to go to 9 million people by 2056. That's the official forecast from the state government. We're do, at three and a half. Do you find those figures staggering? Oh, it is absolutely mind blowing. Well, so at the turn of the century, so we're talking, you know, January 1st, years, yeah. 2000, yep. Melbourne's population was just under three and a half million. And it's currently now about 5.3 million. And it's projected to hit 9 million people by 2056. So in only 56 years, uh, it will have added, what's that, five and a half million people? What a, what a depressing thought. And, and the other thing, as someone who's recently been driving in Melbourne, if you think back that same 25, 30 years about driving around in Melbourne, I re recall thinking to myself when I was living in London, gee, I'd like to be driving around in Melbourne once again, because it was driving around Melbourne was child's play. Oh, the fantastic. roads were generally pretty okay, whereas recently when I've driven around in Melbourne, I thought, by Joe, this has turned into sheer hell. It is, it is, and, and, and it's not just roads, it's everything. So it's the whole livability of Melbourne has just become a joke. And I see it every year. I, I, I do boxing, um, you know, it used to be a 20-minute drive during peak hour to my boxing gym, and now it's 30. And yeah. It's only a couple of years. It's just insane. So now I don't go during busy times anymore because it's just, I just can't do it. I can't justify it. It's too hard. But it's like, but it's not just that. It's everything. Uh, and you know, you, you're quite right. I used to, I used to, uh, you know, drive around in the nineties, and it was, it was dream. It was a dream driving around Melbourne back then. And back then, I used to think sometimes, oh, the traffic sucks. You get down Punt Road or something like that, or Hoddle Street around there, and you know, you get a little bit of congestion. And I used to think it was terrible, but nothing compared to now. Like I'd take that any day of the week. And, and that, then, of course, you know, leads us on to one of your recent favourite hobby horses, which is the uh, Circle Route Railway around Melbourne. Yes, yes. Uh, the, arguably the worst infrastructure project I've ever, ever seen. The the uh, 90 kilometre suburban rail loop, it was the brained part of former Premier Daniel Andrews, and announced that just before the 2018 election, when concerns about Melbourne's population growth and livability were at a, you know, were at a then peak. Yep. Uh, Dan Andrews, about month before the election came out and said, I'm going to build a 90 kilometre rail loop around Melbourne for $50 billion, which is, which is the number he plucked out of thin air. We're uh, already unfortunately, looking at $200 billion, aren't we? Yes, it's, well, it's over 200 now is the latest estimate. But, you know, Dan Andrews pulled that out of thin air. Unfortunately, a bit like net zero, it's like a brand name. You can say rail and people go, all, you know, fuzzy eyed and they start gushing over it. So the, the term rail resonated with the voters because I thought rail equals good, not car, not roads, you know, um, even though it made no sense. Like, who wants to catch a train from Cheltenham to Box Hill? Absolutely nobody. Like, what, what is the purpose of that from Cheltenham to Box Hill? They're, they're, they're two places you never never want to go. Like, it's not really – they're not destinations. I don't understand why they're building this rail loop there. It makes no sense. But the, the rail loop made no sense when it was $50 billion. It never went through Infrastructure Victoria. It never went through Infrastructure Australia. The Victorian Transport Department didn't even get, with, get wind of it before he announced it. Um, it was basically one of these things whereby it was announced before any work had been done on it. And then it just took a life on its own. He took it to the election. They won the election. And then suddenly it's like, oh, no, no, but Victorians have voted for this. Therefore, we've got to do it. Yeah. And then it's just snowballed. And then now the cost has risen fourfold. The, our idiotic uh, current leader, Jacinta Allen, uh, signed the first contract of it in December against everybody's advice. Every expert that said, do not sign this because... It makes no sense and it's unaffordable. And then now she's just signed the second contract. So it's it's happening. And 
as a result, Victoria's already got the worst credit rate in the country. It's got the most debt. We are absolutely, you know, struggling uh, financially. And the state government's now cutting cutting spending to hospitals. It's now delayed indefinitely the airport rail link. It's now cutting funding to regional roads. The latest one we heard today. At the same time as it's it's, it's greenlit more funding for the suburban rail loop. So effectively, this one project is going to suck. Victoria's infrastructure and services budget for decades to come. And it basically means that if you're living in a growth area of Melbourne to the north or the west, which is starved of infrastructure, you're not going to get anything because it's all going to go into this boondoggle project that nobody wants. And even the government's own, uh, you know, the Herald Sun uh, released some unpublished data, which was kept secret uh, from about a year or so ago which said that even under the government's own modelling or modelling presented to the government, once the suburban rail loop's built, almost nobody's going to travel on it, you know, compared to the Werribee line, the Pakenham line, all those other lines that are in demand. Yeah. So we're basically just building a ghost train to Nobu Air for $200 billion. And honestly, I think it's the whole thing's just a development scam because they're using this as an excuse. So the whole excuse for building the project is because Melbourne's population is going to grow to 9 million people because of mass immigration, which nobody wants. So therefore, that's the justification. And then now, because they're building this project, they're now just the fine building 30-storey towers along the route. So the whole thing's just become a development play. It's become a developer Ponzi play, whereby all this land's been rezoned. And I guarantee you, a whole bunch of the Victorian government's mates going to make a mozza from it because they'll probably give them the inside running to buy up all the land along the, along the site and it's going to get upzoned and rezoned and everything and they're going to just make a trade it like monopoly and make make themselves billions of dollars but in the end it's victorian taxpayers are going to pay we're going to pay through less services more debt uh probably credit rating downgrade and less infrastructure if you live in those areas that actually needs the infrastructure all to get a boondoggle ghost train that's barely going to be used and nobody wanted at that point, I'd chime in with the observation that although they don't have the $200 billion railway project yet, uh, New South Wales government finances aren't looking a whole heap better. But my question on behalf of the rest of Australia, or, or those people outside Melbourne at least, or outside Sydney at least, is at a certain point, if, if Australia is nudged into a situation where the current model of economic development no longer stacks up, then presumably the federal government would need to come to bail out either Victoria and or New South Wales. And at that point, all of Australia would probably end up paying a price for that sort of stuff. And at the yeah. same time, we're still going to, if you take what you've just said, which I've read as well about we're not going to have usage of that system that we, we think or, or the government, Victorian state government, is currently telling us that it's expecting. If we're not going to have that usage of the system, then we're probably still going to have the cars on the road, which is still going to lead to all sorts of congestion issues and infra other infrastructure issues which we theoretically at least building the suburban rail loop to get around. Yeah, 100%. Uh, that, that's, you know, unfortunately it's a rat wheel economy we've got. And, you know, Victoria has already been bailed out to a degree. I mean, we saw the, the reallocation of the GST. Victoria got about an extra, what was it, $8 billion or something? It was a huge amount of money. Yeah. Whereby New South Wales got stripped of money and they're actually losing $200 million, despite the fact that New South Wales actually has received more migrants. Than, than Victoria is. But it's also uh, taken from some sectors of the economy. In this case, as you say, I, I tend to think it's a real estate development play. It is. But where, if we say, okay, we're building transport infrastructure to come at the cost of uh, health services infrastructure or, you know, even supporting manufacturing or even, even doing something with education, for example, which might potentially earn us a buck. We're not actually even investing in ourselves as a country with some of these projects. No, no, no. It's just look, look. A lot of it's just a just a millstone around our neck. Uh, obviously, especially you know in the case of the suburban railway, we've also got. But one of the problems is the federal government just keeps pumping more people into you know Melbourne, Sydney, etc. And the state governments are reacting by just trying to build stuff to keep up. 
then a lot of these projects are completely inefficient and they're suffering from massive cost blowouts. Obviously, suburban rail leaves the worst of the worst. But, you know, for example, the North East Link, that was announced to cost, that was expected to cost $15.8 billion, now going to cost $26 billion. That's a $10 billion cost overrun. We've seen this right across the board on infrastructure projects across Victoria, which is one of the reasons why the state is in absolute dire straits with debt. It's got the lowest credit rate in the country, it's got the highest debt, it's got the worst debt profile, and it's most likely to get a credit rate and downgrade. Uh, and the other and reason, it has a, a significantly higher proportion of public servants. Yes, that's right. And, and, and that's another reason. You know, Victoria's public sector grew by 59% in the 15 years, the, the 2023 financial year. That's against a population increase of 29%. That's 59% increase in public servants. By comparison, New South Wales over the same period had a 28% increase in public servants. So, you know, and, and, and Victoria's public service pay bill over that same 15 year period up to financial year 2023 grew by 152% versus New South Wales, which grew by 87%. So Victoria is just bloated to the max on bureaucrats, public servants, as well as boondoggle and expensive infrastructure. And that's the reason why the state is in dire straits. If you think that's the way the state is in, in dire straits, how do you see Australia, the national economy? Are we that far away from it? Yeah, look, 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 not as bad as Victoria. I mean, Victoria is probably like the, 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 the worst state out of the major states out of the economy. So it's the worst state um, which is dragging down the economy overall because we don't have any resource wealth. We don't have anything here. But at the same time, the, 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 the model, um, the only thing separating the other states from Victoria is the fact that they have resources to sell the rest of the world. And really, to be quite frank, you took those away, they're probably like Victoria as well. So, yeah, Australia doesn't really have anything. Like we've got a very unsophisticated economy. The areas that we had some sophistication in, i.e. manufacturing, et cetera. We've got, like rid, closing, of we've got rid of it. We've got rid of it, closing down because we've given ourselves ridiculously. We've, we've shot ourselves in the foot with high energy costs so they can't compete. So really, we just had, you know, as Dave Llewellyn Smith's moniker is, we're a houses and holes economy. And it's not a sustainable economy long term. And unfortunately, the holes part of that economy is built on a sort of old paradigm, which the world's trying to get away from for net zero and all this other stuff. I still think it's going to run for a long time because the world just needs energy, simple as that. But, you know, that, that sort of stuff that we're highly competitive in, we don't even tax properly. And then we dilute the wealth we have from that by running an absurdly high immigration program, which then waters down our wealth. I mean, can you imagine if Norway had adopted the same approach to us and they, you know, they tried to increase their population, or they, their, their plan was to grow the population by 50% in the next 39 years, which is our, our plan. Well, sovereign, Norway's sovereign wealth fund wouldn't be worth $280,000 US per citizen. If they grew it by 50%, they're going to obviously, you know, shrink what that's worth per resident. So the worst off per capita. But unfortunately, because we don't tax our resources properly, we don't have the financial incentive not to run a high immigration program because the way the federal government says, if you're in the Australian Treasury, because we don't tax our resources properly, the only the, the, the main game in town with tax revenue is personal income taxes. So the easiest way to grow personal income taxes, well, there's two ways. Bracket creep, number one, where you just don't adjust the tax scales and you let inflation pull everyone into high, te- high tax yeah. brackets. But number two is you grow the number of taxpayers. And the easiest way to grow the number of taxpayers is just import people to work. But you need those guys to have meaningful jobs. And and Australia's investing in having bedpan economy jobs or or services jobs which don't provide pay rises. I don't think think the Australian Treasury cares. One of the problems with this whole, Australia's whole economic structure is that the Commonwealth Government collects about 80% of tax revenue, just over 80%. The states and local governments correct everything else. So the feds get all the benefits from immigration because they collect all the extra personal income tax and also the company tax from having more people buying stuff at you know, Harvey Norman, et cetera, which boosts their profits. But the costs of population growth primarily go to the state governments and the state governments which, who don't collect the tax revenue. And as a result, we end up with never getting enough infrastructure, or services get the rate, et cetera, because the states can't afford to provide all this stuff or they sell off everything, like they've done in Victoria, New South Wales, et cetera. 
uh, and you end up with basically companies like Taxa Transurban taking over your whole road network, charging you an arm and a leg just to travel from A to B, whereas 20 years ago you could travel for free. I, I have um, another another thought there. Victoria has recently proposed selling off the births, deaths and marriages registry. That'll see Ancestry.com or, or MyHeritage or whichever one of the, the data providers, uh, they'll be holding Australians to ransom for their own for their own actual data. Yeah, that's, look, we've seen the same everywhere. We've seen the same with the sale of the land titles registry. Yeah. They sold, look, basically our state governments have sold off everything they can sell off. You know, the energy assets, the uh, the road network, the land titles registry, the ports, everything they can sell off to try and get, they've basically gone to cash converters, sold the family jewels for some quick money so they can then try and band-aid over the cracks, build a bit more infrastructure, whatever, um, to try and keep up with this manic population growth. But it's a sugar hit. And in the end, you end up being worse off. You end up being a renter in your own country. And that's effectively what Australia is now. And just about every infrastructure project now is a public-private partnership. So it's basically privatised anyway. So you want to build a new toll road, toll, toll road, Transurban ends up basically taking control of it and then charges you an arm and a leg. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's even worse in Sydney here because in Sydney, the turn of the century, you could drive around Sydney and you'd only pay tolls going over the bridge or the, under the tunnel or near the airport. There was a toll right there. But now you can't travel anywhere in Sydney without being stung with a toll because there's like 20 toll roads there. And this is all because, you know, Sydney, the time of the Sydney Olympics, around about then, um, its population was about 3.8 million people. Yeah. It's now about 5.3 million or 5.4 million, thereabouts. They've grown very quickly as well, and they've had to build an infrastructure for these people. So they've built all these toll roads, et cetera. They're all privately tolled. And as a result, you know, 20 years ago, you could drive around less traffic congestion and you didn't have to pay for it, by and large. Now, more traffic congestion, you've got to pay an arm and a leg. And this is, we, we've, we, we have created a toll booth economy in Australia. Could I just bring you to a sector like the university sector? They've been hammered by initially COVID and they've been flooded with students coming back. But there's also widespread indication that at some point, probably not too far away, there is going to be some sort of enforced rationalisation of the sector. Uh, would you expect something like that out of Australian education? You were talking earlier about the vocational system, which I completely agree has been rorted in many respects. But now Australia is at a point where it probably needs to start looking at recreating the old state run vocational, like the yep. TAFE system. Yep. And with the university sector, it probably does need to look at weaning the whole system off the desperate reliance on foreign students and focusing once again on, hang on, what are we providing Australians in terms of education which will provide them with meaningful intellectual or employment opportunities in the future? Yeah, and, and look, Australia shot itself in the foot. I think Howard started it when he got rid of the trade schools, et cetera. Um, you know, whereby it used to be, if you weren't inclined to be an academic, you'd go to a trade school, you'd learn trades in high school, then you'd go into a TAFE, and then you'd, you know, or go straight into apprenticeship and you'd become a carpenter, a plumber, et cetera. Uh, for some reason, we decided that it wasn't cool to do trades and that everyone should go to university. So that was encouraged. And gradually, well, our 30 years later, we're now massive shortages in trades. We're oversupplies with uni university graduates. And to make matters worse, this current Labor government, um, after in increasing university attainment to about 45% of young people, which is an absurdly high number, more than we need, they now want to increase it to 55%. So we're going to be have even more university qualified Uber drivers, basically, and that's the well, you know, that's the university Uber. graduated shop assistants or that's something it. like that. Yeah, For totally, instance. total waste of resources, waste of time when really we need people doing more vocational stuff. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, we've we've diluted the quality of that education by going hog wild into internationals. So now that and, and, and look, I speak to young people all the time, whether it's my boxing gym, whatever, people, you know, kids are at uni, I ask them. Sometimes, you know, you often meet kids who are doing commerce, which is what I did. Yeah. I, did mate, I did, obviously, honours and economics and stuff. But, um, and you talk about what their experience is compared to yours, and it's always the same story. 
group assignments, get paired up with a few internationals, they end up yeah. doing all the work. Uh, the internationals get the same same score, blah, blah, blah. Like just crap learning experience. You've not just touched fun. on something there I would like to raise with you. You have a university education in economics. What do you think of the current, not just education of economics, but the discussion in the public domain of economic issues? Uh, I think it's just, unfortunately, the whole... Look, there's a lot of really good economists out there. Don't, don't get me wrong, there's a few rippers out there. Um, but I think it's it's one of these industries that's kind of, like most industries in Australia, it's sold out to vested interests. So, you know, let's be real. If you work as an economist, you don't have that, you got, don't have that many choices. You work for a you know, lobby group. So whether it be industry, Housing Industry Association or some some sort of industry group. Or in one of the public sectors. Yeah, yeah, or in one of the public sectors. So you're either indoctrinated into you got to take the Treasury view on something, yeah. which is you know, pro big Australia or whatever, whatever it is. Or you take the view of the of your employer, uh, which has got a vested interest in whatever area. And that's basically just got to follow the money. And that, and, that, and that's um that's why a lot of the economic commentary is pretty poor. And also I think there's just a degree of wokeism as well, which is drifted into everything these days. But, you know, you see it all the time with economics where economists twist themselves around, you know, twist themselves backwards to try and argue that immigration has no impact on the housing market, for example. Well, I, I, uh, Which is just I absurd. must admit, I'd observe they twist themselves around to avoid any discussion of immigration. more Because they don't want to be perceived as racist. Yeah. Even though, even though a number is not racist. Yeah. And, you know, you see that all the time. So to me, that's just intellectual fraud. But, um, you know, yeah, look, that, that, that being said, I don't think it's any worse or better than it was when I did it, necessarily. It's just, unfortunately... The reason I raise it, Leith, is actually that uh, early 1990s, I shared an office in Canberra with an American guy who related to me one day, he thought the quality of economic discussion in the media and in politics and in public circles in Australia was far superior to that that he experienced in the United States. I, I, at early 1990s, I actually worked overseas in an investment bank. And so I'm, you know, quite economically literate and familiar with the types of issues discussed. And at that time, I would have probably agreed with him. So you had guys like Keating and Hawke talking about microeconomic reform and you know, Keating in particular used to talk about the need to be competitive and all. I, I think he's lost the plot a little bit these days. But there's no one banging that type of drum anymore. You can get good good commentary in the mainstream media and you get very valid points made from on some issues from some quarters, but you don't get a comprehensive analysis, I would suggest, the way you once did. And even the big, uh, even the big public sectors don't really put out the same running commentary that they used to do. And, and like if you look through the mainstream media, I still read Steve Bartholomew's. I still like reading Alan Kohler. I like Ian Berender and Mike Jander at uh, the ABC. But scouting around for people that you would actually pay attention to, and and think to yourself, these guys have got a coherent logical data back position to put to you, they're vastly outnumbered by the people who either do or don't want to mention certain facets of what they think they're contending, usually because of what you said about woke considerations. They don't want to actually think about the actual economic drivers of it. Would you think there's any substance to my contention there or not really? No, I think you're 100% right. There, look, 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 there are some good commentators out there. They're just you know, needle in the haystack sort of stuff. Um, look, you know, one of the better ones who I like, you know, following is Tarek Brooker. Oh, Twitter. yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah, he's fantastic. So, because he's got, an, he's got a sort of unconventional view. He he doesn't mind calling a spade a spade. Alex Joyner's fantastic, IFM investor. Yeah, exactly. And those yep. guys produce Justin loads Farber. of data. Yeah, that's right. And and look, Shane Oliver's really good too. Yeah, on, on, yeah. Uh, so, but, so I often get a lot of my... Uh, my inspiration and et cetera and whatever from Twitter when I just uh, – like, like Twitter's a cesspit, don't get me wrong, but yeah. 
it, but there are some there are some you know diamonds in the rough there. So Tariq Brook is excellent. Uh, uh, Alex, Alex Joyner is fan, really good. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know Justin Farbo is really good too, and uh, Shane Holt is really good as well. So you know there, there are some there are some good ones and just randoms like just random people who uh, who who just seem to come up on my feed just to give you know interesting insights etc. So yeah, there are there are yeah there are. Cam there are some Murray is another one. No. Oh, of course, yeah, no, no, Cam's excellent. Um, yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned Cam off the bat. He's also a mate of mine too. Yeah, I literally yeah. just texted him while I've been talking to you right now. <laughs> um, we just texted each other. But um, yeah, so, that, so they're all excellent. Yeah, Cam obviously talks more, uh, more you know, policy and some. He, he's a bit more esoteric in, in his. He, he's very unconventional and looks at things from different angles, which is fantastic. In terms of like just sort of current, uh, you know, data and things like that, the other guys are. You know, really good on just the current state of play in the economy on, you know, the latest wage release or that, that sort of thing. Well, I must admit, I rarely ever go to Twitter at all. But when I do, I always look for Justin Farbo or Alex Joyner. I'm just trying to think. Tarek Brooker. Tarek Brooker, of course. Um, those guys, they're forever pumping out charts in particular, but also actual data. So yeah. that's vitally important. With paying attention to those guys, have you seen any positive or, or promising uh, policy positions of things that Australia might do? Not really, no. Unfortunately, I'll actually look. Look, one thing looks like we may, but I've said this before. You know, every time it seems to get scuttled last month, we might may finally get some anti-money laundering uh, regulations on uh, on on real estate agents. Uh, it, it was and, the Attorney General last week saying we needed it. That's right, but I mean we have we have been down this road before, whereby they've committed to it and then pulled the pin. Yeah. Um, you know, Australia's commitment to money laundering on on property gatekeepers, real estate gatekeepers, uh, began when I worked at the Australian Treasury all the way back in two thousand three. Well, I was in a unit called the International Economy Division, and the guys who are on the other side of the fence are literally a divider about a metre away working on this um, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing. And back then, they were working on the draft. And I think in 2006, Australia agreed to implement these anti-money laundering rules for residential property gatekeepers. And here we are in 2024, we still haven't done it. And we're one of the few countries in the world who hasn't implemented these rules. And as a result, we've become a honeypot for laundered funds into our property. And finally, the... ALP is committed to implementing the rules, and um, we, we shall see if it actually comes to fruition. But if it I, does, I need well, to ask you about those guys who sat over the partition from you. Are you still in touch with any one of them? No, I haven't seen them for years, so uh, I, I wouldn't would almost guarantee them. they're living in a shack by a beach over at maybe Sejuna or the south coast of West Australia or somewhere off the coast of Tasmania thinking, why the hell did I ever do all that work on anti-money laundering? Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, <laughs> uh, that unfortunately, I don't think anything I've ever worked for in the government, whether it's federal government or state government, has ever mattered to anything. So it's just the way it works, you know. Not, like, it's very hard to change the system. And, and as one person wasting time to another person wasting time, but at least you're providing magnificent commentary, as you've done for a dozen years now, how does it feel to have done that for a dozen years? It's gone so quick. Look, this whole thing just sort of, the whole macro business thing just sort of spawned out of nothing. So I was working at Goldman Sachs at the time. I was bored out of my brain, doing a job I hated. It was very easy, an easy job. I was doing regulatory capital. Yeah. So basically every time Goldman Sachs did a loan or took a position, I had to calculate the capital charge that we had to hold back, et cetera. It was one of those jobs that was very technical. But also, once you knew it, it was incredibly easy. And I've been doing that for, you know, four years when I started Macro on the side. And I started, I was so bored, I started a blog. Actually, sorry, it was three years in I started a personal blog just to basically fill in my time when I was bored at work. And then that blog became kind of popular. It's called Unconventional Economist. And then I met Dave, who had his own blog. And then we caught, caught up for lunch one day because it turned out he worked in Melbourne. And we were like, oh, how about we join blogs? And then we chipped in 500 bucks each with another guy who left years ago. Uh, and we created a macro business. And then after about a year, Goldman's gave me an uh, ultimatum. They found out that I was doing this on the side. And they said, look, you got to stop it or quit. And I ended up quitting, which 
in the short term was the worst decision ever made because I lived on baked beans for a year or so. Um, you like baked really beans? High... Yeah, no, no, I don't like baked beans. But, but I uh, basically quit a very high paying job that was, I was ridiculously overpaid at Goldman for what I did uh, to basically earn one third as much. Um, but then, yeah, it just stood it out for the long, long haul and gradually grew it into what it is now. And then 12 years later, you know, this has become working from home for 12 years and this has become my longest job by a long shot. So, yeah, it's it's definitely been a journey. Mate, on that note, I propose we close up for this particular discussion. Thank you once again for a magnificent discussion of the issues the Australian economy currently faces. And I hope to have another chew over with you before too long. You have been listening to a discussion about the Australian economy with Leif Van Onsler, Chief Economist and Co-Founder of Macro Business. July 2024. Thank you for your time. Please join us again.